morning. Uh, good morning. Um, this morning, we are going to explore game-changing digital strategies and sustainability. I would like to uh, introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, Katrina Craigwell is Director of Global Content and Programming at General Electric. She is responsible for digital content production and distribution strategy for GE in the US, as well as partnering with GE's digital teams globally. She was named for, uh, to Forbes 30 Under 30 in marketing and advertising for 2014, and Ed Age's Creativity 50 in 2012. Uh, welcome, thank uh, Katrina. You, thank you. Uh, also on the panel, Steven Weissmuller is a respected leader in environmental sustainability for nearly 15 years. Steve currently serves as IBM's global services leader for environmental affairs and sustainability solutions. As an experienced team leader, Steve has been recognized by the US EPA as a strategic thinker and helped IBM win the EPA Smartway Transport Partnership Award. Steve joined the global services team in 2010, following five years in IBM's corporate environmental affairs department. Steve currently resides in Golden's Bridge, New York, with his wife and three children. Welcome, uh, Steven. Thank you. So let's begin the conversation by providing a framework um, and define sustainability. What is sustainability? We know that um, the Brandtland Commission of the United Nations defined sustainability in the 80s as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. If we fast forward to today, how would you define sustainability? It's quite easy. Um, there's a lot of hype about sustainability out there each and every day. Everybody sees it in the papers, the press, uh, it's in the media, social media, uh, but the hype is coming to an end uh, as major brands are adopting sustainability as a core business function. Uh, sustainability is what it is, uh, people, planet, and profit. Um, we're here to be in business. We're here to protect our planet. And I think most importantly for me personally is citizens, uh, the people helping your neighbors, helping your citizens, helping your coworkers. So when I look at sustainability, I look at it holistically as a business, as a father, as a husband, uh, as a neighbor, and it's making the right choices, helping uh, our planet be here for the next generation better than it was previously. So thanks. So we don't have to colonize Mars, at least uh, not immediately. Not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I, that, that resonates so much. And I think at GE, we think about sustainability, um, we think about innovation, we think about partnership, and we think about the future. It's the 10th year anniversary of our Ecoimagination platform, which had the goal of increasing um, efficiency and reducing the environmental impact of our, our technology um, for our customers and across GE. And I think it's very, as a conversation, so, so in my role uh, as part of the marketing team, from a brand standpoint, our job is to um, deepen the awareness and understanding of what GE does. Many people know GE for appliances, light bulbs, may not know that we are manufacturing power generation uh, uh, technology, uh, jet engine technology, healthcare technology, and so it's A, having that conversation and bringing that to light, and then allowing a conversation around the future um, with you know, voices, expert voices from GE, but also the next generation of voices uh, that we're seeing that are interested in science and technology. So those are some of the things that we think about around sustainability. Oh, wonderful. Um, we are uh, going to hear next on uh, specific case studies from both companies. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Steve. Oh, excellent. Love these. Hopefully, I don't mess things up. But uh, I guess I'll press the green button, and we'll get going here. So brought some cool things. Uh, first is a video. I feel video really will capture your imagination, show you a really amazing project we're doing for the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, it's a football team down in Georgia. If you're not familiar with the Atlanta Falcons, uh, 
Not my favorite team. I grew up in, in North Carolina. I grew up in Charlotte, uh, so I'm a Panthers fan. But, you know, you got to go where the business is, is leading you. And, and so the Atlanta Falcons called us up. Uh, we're doing some really innovative projects, but we're going to start with the video. And uh, I'll, I'll share some, uh, some of the sustainable aspects of this with you afterwards. We're going to build a world-class sports and entertainment facility that I think you really can't compare it to anything else that's out there right now. The NFL uh, looks at stadium designs and critiques them. Their conclusion was this probably is going to be the greatest sports and entertainment venue in the world. IBM's a huge technology partner bringing to life the, the back end of the building. But not only is it the technology and the hardware and, and the wiring, it's the thought process and the systems that are in place to operate it. What we want to accomplish here really matches with uh, the vision uh, of Arthur Blank and, and, the, and the Falcons and, and Major League Soccer Atlanta. And they want to have an iconic stadium that has the best fan experience in the world. We are going to have an IBM Client Briefing Center, which is really the heart of the technology within the stadium. This is where we, we are going to house our data center. So it is truly the heart and pulse of everything connected within the stadium. Coming to the stadium and leaving the stadium is the first thing and the last thing that people experience. So we need to give them real-time traffic information. We need to help them to their parking lot. We need to give them information that gets them into the stadium and then likewise on the way out. This is about differentiating the Falcons. This is not just about creating yet another stadium experience. This is about tapping into the community, pulling out those insights, being inventive. So to think about actually having a living, breathing example of where we've partnered with the client to create a great fan experience is something that we are super, super, super excited about. We have a great partner here to push us to the next level and redefine the stadium experience. Great. One of my favorite videos, I keep watching it over and over, and I, I keep asking myself, well, what's sustainable about building uh, a new football stadium? And I'll tell you, the experience, the digital experience that fans will receive from a state-of-the-art Wi-Fi passive optical network that's being installed at the center will reduce electrical consumption, reduce the space needed to house the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure behind delivering, uh, get these fat, 63,000 square feet of HD video over a halo board 2,000 plus video displays across the center. And at the top of the screen, as you saw that video, a 360 degree video dis display uh, real time. So, you know, IBM's smarter intelligent stadium network uh, coupled with our IT uh, analytics on a cloud platform are delivering the, the next stage stadium, which will be operational in 2017. So just about a year and a half away from delivering an amazing world-class experience. Uh, I wanted to share a couple other examples this morning with you. Uh, one that comes uh, sort of close to heart here, I have a lot of family in the Netherlands, my family is Dutch, uh, and so this project, Digital Delta, is certainly one that I wanted to share with everyone today. Uh, again, it, it com combines big data transformation on a cloud platform Imagine if 55% of the population here is always under the threat of being flooded, uh, and, and that's the state of the Netherlands at, at the time, being a, a low-lying country. Um, by modeling weather events, we're able to uh, store water in, in strategic uh, areas across this country, uh, divert floods from uh, areas where there's large populations, and we're doing that with technology. So another sustainability example, you can hopefully read some of these slides if, if um, you're interested. All of this information, if you go to IBM.com uh, and, and search on any of these terms, you, you can learn more. So let me move on um, to another uh, showcase example. Uh, IBM Research uh, is another segment of IBM I didn't really tell you about IBM, I'm assuming you know, but we're 400,000 people in 172 
countries, uh, and we spend about $6 billion each year investing in our research division. Uh, and right here in Yorktown Heights, if you've ever been, if you haven't, please, you know, let's find an opportunity to get you there as a world-class research uh, division. Um, part of what we do is, is, as IBMers is not look at uh, programs, you know, too specifically, but we, we're moving to Africa, we're moving all over the world, and Ebola, as everybody's, I'm sure, aware, uh, the outbreak uh, last year, really, the question came to IBM, how, how can we help? Um, uh, so sustainability, you know, again, going back to the citizens, what would power you? What, how could you be empowered to uh, help a neighbor? Well, in Sierra Leone, they're using their mobile phones to text message or use a regular phone call to the, I want to make sure I get this right, their open government initiative, which completely on a map targets specific areas so you know where an Ebola breakout is occurring. You can then deliver the soap that you need to cleanse the population. Uh, you can target those resources and you can be educated. You, and, and through radio broadcasts and through mobile technology, IBM is able to pinpoint specific areas uh, using big data again on the cloud um, and, and using those uh, uh, video analytics and, and other abilities to, to showcase here. So um, I think we're gonna have some Q&A at the end, but I'm gonna move on to my last example. And this is my favorite, and I think I probably said the other two were my favorite, but this is really my favorite because I'm a meteorologist and weather is my business. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have an undergraduate meteorology degree. I, I almost got into broadcast, but then I chose engineering and sustainability and all that fun stuff for IBM. Uh, but weather does affect business. And again, you know, what does it mean to sustainability? And and yeah. I, will, I will have a question on that topic. Uh, how do you use data from third parties, such as weather data, to consumer purchase scanning data and to trending social media topics? That's a very good question. <laughs> so, social media. Uh, you may have read recently IBM is uh, partnering with Twitter and Facebook and a number of the different social media outlets. We're looking at that information and there, there's power in having that data. And to the question about weather, I think being able to inform citizens about weather events, uh, the predictive analytic aspect. So for instance, uh, Superstorm Sandy came through. We had pretty good awareness about 36 hours ahead of time where exactly, but the deployment of assets, uh, for example, electrical utility trucks uh, to key areas that were going to be uh, severely impacted certainly helps get the infrastructure back up and running. Um, insurance companies, if they know a hailstorm is coming, can notify their, uh, their, their insurance policy holders and say, there's a high risk this afternoon and uh, we estimate 80% chance that hail is going to impact your vehicle. Can you please move it to a safe location? Um, let me give you another example. Groceries this winter. Uh, if, if you uh, went through the cold era uh, of, of zero degree days, uh, businesses saw a 15% uh, drop in their business because of the cold weather. And being able to predict days ahead of time what they needed to store on those shelves certainly could help those businesses. And last but not least, uh, utilities. Um, for every five degrees uh, down in Texas, when it goes from 90 to 95 degrees, uh, it gets hot out. People don't want to go uh, to the store, don't want to go shopping. And so they lose an estimated $24 million. So weather does affect business, and uh, IBM's here to, to use some of our analytics and IT capacity to help businesses understand. So. And the data is real-time data in the markets you operate? It's real time, and not only is it real time, it's predictive. So we're actually predicting in, in advance, and you can ask questions to one of our new supercomputers, Watson, 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Watson, you can, Watson takes and looks at everything that's occurred in the past and what's going to potentially happen in the future. So it's sort of AI in its infancy, but we're going to see more and more of that. So uh, it's an amazing time. Uh, 10 years ago when I joined the company, I, I joined as corporate environmental staff. I was on spreadsheets calculating greenhouse gas emissions. And now I'm using Watson to, to look at 300 years worth of uh, Volstack ice core data to uh, help our clients understand how climate change might impact their business uh, going forward. So certainly uh, an interesting time and, and a, a lot of fun to, to be here. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Katrina? Is it? Great. Awesome. Um, who here is tasked with producing content, digital content for their brand? Not easy stuff. <laughs> um, you know, when, when, uh, when we think about storytelling digitally, we think that we are, you know, not necessarily competing with our general industrial set of competitors, but we're competing with anyone who is producing great science and technology content. Gizmodo, Popular Science, Wired, CNET, et cetera. It's sites who we love, but we have to be as good as them, if not better, with our content to earn a seat at the table and to get people's attention. And that stands true no matter what the topic is, right? Whether you're talking about locomotives, sustainability, big data, whatever it is, the market is so saturated that to get a story out there and to get engagement around a topic, um, we really all have to turn into publishers, and, and that's a lot of uh, what my team is, is experimenting with at GE. So the example that I have to share is one around the release of our new Tier 4 locomotive. And about 10 years ago, the EPA released a new set of emission standards in the US, which were, are fairly aggressive and excellent. Um, and our teams at GE Transportation and GE Global Research have been working since that um, release to produce a locomotive and manufacture a locomotive that would meet those, those um, new standards, which were represented about a 70% reduction in emissions, and get them out to our customers and to our partners. Now, this is generally the challenge that we have around storytelling when we're talking to a broad audience, which is, as I tell you that story, and if I were to send you a white paper on that story, your eyes might glaze over unless you're part of the customer set who is going to purchase a locomotive and needs this information, and of course we get that to you. And so we think a lot about how we lean into visual storytelling, how we lean into the connection between art and science and technology in order to earn that seat at the table, in order to get your intention, and in order to engage you around a really positive conversation um, around the future of technology. So this is a, these are a few shots from a shoot we did. This is the Tier 4 locomotive uh, hauling cars on a test track out in Pueblo, Colorado. So it's in the middle of an open field. We have about 20 miles uh, of track. And we wanted to see and show off what it was like to put this, this new engine through its paces. Uh, it uh, gathers a little tumbleweed here as it goes. It's very cute. Um, and we had the opportunity to work with a photographer named Vince Laferre, who is a, a highly acclaimed prize-winning photographer. And he does a series out of the side of a helicopter. So he shoots cities at night. It's called Project Air. And he captures these aerial shots. He literally is strapped into a helicopter and hangs out the side and captures these beautiful shots. And we thought, well, we have a beautiful open space. Come join us and shoot here. And so that's just, this was my first ride in a helicopter, by the way, which was like, this is a mind-blowing way to start riding in helicopters. Um, and so we chased this locomotive around the track and we produced some great art that would help anchor the story that we were telling. And you know, when we think about this, we think about, we want to make this content available to publishers, to partners. We are agnostic about the platform. We want to get it out to the right audience. And so you know, we um, worked with a great partner agency group, SJR, and we made these photos available to Popular Science, Gizmodo, Wired, et cetera. And so they actually picked up one of the shots and gave it um, a full kind of homepage skin. This is an advertising. This is great content being provided to a publisher who is open to great content. Um, really strong feature in Wired. Again, this is not Railroad Age Weekly. This is a broad publication about science and technology and an, a great opportunity to take that conversation about sustainability and the future of technology wider. And, and uh, the, this particular article is a great set of the photos. And then a pretty hard-hitting article about, um, pretty hard-hitting coverage about the, the 
emissions reduction and what it actually went into creating this technology. And so we're, we continue to experiment with this more and more. How do we operate as a publisher? How do we create high quality content that will get our foot in the door to have the conversations that we want? Wonderful. Uh, th that's, that's a great project to highlight. Um, um, how would you describe in both of your companies, and if you'd like uh, Katrina to start first, why is sustainability um, important in your company and to what extent the content you're creating and digital in general is driving the sustainability agenda? Our company is solving large-scale infrastructure challenges and the future of large-scale infrastructure. And so I think sustainability is important to the world and our company is looking at through innovation and partnership, how to solve that. So, you know, anything from something like this locomotive to uh, we have a gas engine, the Enbacher gas engine that produces power from gasified trash to uh, we are installing China's largest wind farm in partnership with uh, Huaneng. And thinking about at the country level and at the, the large customer level, how do we partner to uh, build the future of infrastructure? And I think our job through this content is, you know, that, that sustainability agenda and that technology agenda is being driven by our business leaders and our research leaders. And our job through this content is to allow for that conversation to happen, to A, do a, a, a good job of increasing the understanding of the breadth of what we do, um, opening our doors, allowing people in. So we, I'll just share another quick example. We um, started doing things called InstaWalks. Anybody here running Instagram feeds? Everyone here is familiar with Instagram, I'm gonna assume. Anyone running Instagram feeds? Uh, anyone seen InstaWalks before? Familiar with that concept? So it's the idea of taking a group of people who are interested in the same thing and bringing them to shoot that thing together. So for example, um, if everyone's into cherry blossoms or a museum, whatever it is, you get that group of Instagram users together, that community, and you go and you shoot that together. We started doing that at our facilities. But these are facilities that not many people get to go to. So a jet engine test facility, we have one um, in Peebles, Ohio, which is in the middle of a forest, uh, uh, fairly remote. You don't really get a lot of people getting to check out the plant floor, let alone do it with an iPhone in hand and posting to social media in real time. So that was like a, a pretty important culture shift and really exciting for us. Um, the second one we did was with a customer in Cape Cod who is using our wind turbine technology. And we invited three famous Instagrammers and three fans from the G community to join us, shoot the wind turbines, and actually do a turbine climb. So getting them inside the machines to be able to touch the machines and understand the machines, um, and so our job is really to open, increase the awareness of what we're doing, of the breadth of what we're doing, and open our doors and let people onto facilities. And that then helps back up and that helps broaden the awareness of, of our entire agenda around the future of technology. Wonderful. And I'll take it back to the Atlanta Falcons and IBM's interactive media. I, I, th I think you've all seen the commercials and if you've been to any of the other sporting events like the US Open, Australian, French, Wimbledon, all these major events have great content, real time uh, abilities to, to see shots and, and understand what's going on in the game. Uh, so I, I take that back and look at it from a sustainability standpoint. Um, you know, what are our CEOs, what are, what are our executive suite looking for when it comes back to business, um, you know, is it is it sustainability? It, it's really not. Okay, I'll be frank and honest with you. It's it's sustainability is not the driver. There's there's a financial aspect certainly that's driving your company. There's a reputational aspect, so your brand image, and then more and more so, we're seeing more of a regulatory component coming into play. Um, as Katrina mentioned. The EPA adopted new uh, uh, emission guidelines. Now, those certainly impact GE, they impact IBM, they impact a number of companies out there. Uh, so globally, we're seeing ten, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of new regulations popping up, whether it's product take back, energy efficiency laws, all these things impact the business. And, and while they may be green or environmental, they certainly have a profound effect on your financial viability uh, as well as you know, making the world a better place. So we, 
you know, the, the concept of sustainability and merging those all so that our C-suite understands the meaning of that and, and then how we take it to the next level. Uh, I think that's about uh, the concept of how do you, as a company, create value in the marketplace and how do you capture value? And I think that uh, uh, Katrina also spoke to that point when she uh, spoke about producing content. It's essentially what you're supporting is the company narrative that is supporting the brand and is supporting a lot of other efforts that you do. And uh, I have seen uh, um, while uh, that at both of your companies, uh, sustainability is truly at the core of the business strategy. And it really influences a lot of the decisions that are being made. The financial uh, reason uh, has to be there, of course. Right. Uh, yeah, our CEO uh, in 1971, uh, Thomas Watson Jr., uh, had our first environmental policy for the company. And so 44 years later, you know, we're still living and breathing by, you know, policies and procedures that were put into place. And uh, I think it really starts from the top down. It's, and, and, and a bottoms up approach too, because you have to get, you know, the mass of your employees uh, engaged. If they're not engaged, if they're not passionate about helping your company be better, uh, to be able to go down the street and say, I'm an IBM -er, or I work at a GE or I work at Pepsi, whatever you might be here in Westchester County, uh, it's important because uh, I remember running into somebody from DuPont and they would always honk their horn every time they backed out of their driveway. And I was like, why do you always honk your horn? He was like, it's the safety culture that they've instilled in us here at DuPont. And I was like, well, maybe I should be honking my horn. So anyway, it's, you know, lots of fun things that. So how do you engage various stakeholders and employees, you know, especially at your companies? Uh, we, uh, we have a community. Uh, we, we use a, a media forum. I've, I've got 500 IBMers globally in a global services sustainability community that I interact with daily, weekly, monthly. We've, we've got forums. We've, that's internal. Uh, of course, we're talking to our clients and, and doing the same for them, so. Wonderful. Katrina? I mean, it's, you know, it's about making the right technology decisions for our customers and our future, and, and then our team supporting that and painting that picture over and over and over again. Uh, to what extent, um, uh, do you um, believe that your um, sort of in this process of adopting sustainability and engaging employees and adopting digital technologies is allowing you to reinvent the brand? You mm -hmm. both represent well-established global brands. I think you know we look at digital as a huge opportunity to take take people, whether it's employees or um, an external audience, into the world of GE, which are often places that you can't necessarily go to. So a quick example is we've started experimenting with virtual reality. And we launched our first experience at the end of last year at, on Oculus Rift. And it was an experience around the future of subsea oil and gas. So in most cases, you can't just go down to the bottom of the ocean floor and have a look at a subsea factory and the future of that and, and the future of the technology and the software that would be used there. Um, but in this case, we did an experience off the coast of Brazil where you went down to the ocean floor and you had a chance to kind of understand what a subsea factory was for oil and gas and what the future of that was and, and what GE was working on. Um, and we hooked it up to a rumble chair, so you're in a one-person submarine and then you go <laughs> down, you're like breaking the water, you have a little bit of that experience. And we used it at um, the launch of a research center in Rio, which where they're very much focused on that work. But that experience has now traveled around the world. It's been used in China, in Nigeria, in Canada, uh, in Europe. And we continue to produce those experiences. We have one for the tier four. Um, we're doing it in power and water. And it's great, you know, oftentimes our employees work on technology where th that's impacted by multiple sites and, and then is delivered to a customer and, and operates around the world and they don't always get to see that. And so in that case as well, we just had one of these experiences at a, a retiree event, event and it was a great opportunity to, to, again, give them the chance to go to a facility and see the machine that they worked on in action, um, even if it was virtual. Wonderful. Um, I think the next uh, uh, question would be, uh, we have discussed right before um, um, 
uh, coming on stage that uh, s s both sustainability and digital were defined initially in the 80s and they're maturing now. Um, what do you see um, happening in the future at your companies and generally on both sustainability and, and digital and how will digital drive sustainability? It's, it's interesting you brought that up. We actually just published, we have an Institute for Business Value at IBM. And there's a paper out there, I think you can find it, it's pretty easy to find. It's called Driving Innovation Through Data. And there's five distinct patterns of data-driven innovation. And I wrote these down because I don't want to mess them up because a lot of time uh, was put into that paper. Uh, several fellows and a distinguished engineer at, at our company uh, came together and said, what is the future? Um, like you mentioned, uh, sustainability grew out of an intergovernment panel on climate change in and, and, uh, 1987, and here we are in 2015. So you want five things to take away today, okay? Here, here are five distinct patterns of data-driven innovation. Uh, number one, uh, augmenting products to generate data. So we're, we're seeing a tremendous shift as uh, uh, companies that we work with are, are creating their new products, uh, being able to talk to one another, the internet of things. I hope everyone's on board because this is the wave of the future. Amazon's got your little press button thing now and you can order your you know, laundry detergent. So all these things are connected and, and part of the future. So, so first one, augmenting products to generate data. The second one, digitizing assets. So to your question on, on where's the future, we see it, it that's, it's, it's right there. Three, combining data, data within and across industries. So it's no longer a siloed approach. We're, we're partnering with Facebook. I've, two years ago, IBM, Facebook, I would, you know, what's the connection there? What's, why, you know, Twitter, the Weather Channel. Uh, I can't keep up with the pace at which uh, things are transforming. Number four, trading data. You know, as a, as a uh, pattern going forward, you know, people are value, there's tremendous value in the data. Now, about 90% of all this big data that you hear out there, it's noise. You can cut it out. About one in 10 actually has value. But that one in 10 has tremendous value to the right customer. So whether it's the insurance company, uh, an agricultural unit, uh, somebody who, uh, like a city, a, a infrastructure, somebody who supports infrastructure, they need that data, it's valuable to them. And the last one, codifying a distinctive service capability. Um, that's, that's what we do day in, day out, uh, being able to, to look as a service to sustainability and what capabilities it can bring to our client set. So that's, uh, if you get a chance, I didn't bring it today, but I'm sure it's online, digital uh, driving innovation through data. So, Great. Yep. You know, I think at, at GE, we see the, the transformation in a couple of ways. First, at the industrial level, so to your point about the Internet of Things, you know, we've got the Internet of Industrial Things. We talk a lot uh, about the industrial Internet and do a lot of work around that. So an example of that would be if you have a um, customer has a wind farm with 50 wind turbines and they range from east to west, and they're all able to capture environmental data from what's happening around them. But then they're also able to communicate that from one turbine to the next and adjust operations together without having an operator have to do it, and then feed that information back to the operator as well. So you start to find incredible efficiencies out of assets that are already in place um, through this connectivity. Um, and then I think that you know when you think about digital transformation, at a company like GE, very large, over 130 years old, A, there's a culture shift. So building that openness um, and, you know, it's funny sometimes because I spend a lot of time with our scientists at our research centers and with our engineers. And like, in my mind, they're the coolest people ever. <laughs> like, you have no idea. And, and you know, they're, they're doing real work and I'm over here tweeting. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a special job to get to um, make them rock stars and get them out in front. Um, and so that's, that's really a wonderful thing. And then when you think about you know, the new hardware that's out there. So 
it's gone from desktop to mobile now to virtual reality, augmented reality, wearables. You, you look at Microsoft HoloLens, they're stating that they are creating the new computing interface, taking it completely out of any screen that we've known before. That has implications in storytelling and it has implications in operations. So think of hooking up a virtual reality headset with a live feed to some kind of unmanned field services robot that's climbing a wind turbine. And the operator getting a real time view of what's happen happening with that wind turbine remotely and being able to make decisions more quickly. And so as we start to experiment with these new technologies, whether for storytelling or for operations, um, I think that there's a lot of, there's gonna be a change in a lot of, a lot of innovation and a lot of experimentation there in, in both ways. Wonderful. And um, how do you measure success? What are the metrics that you use? I'm just waiting to sell a jet engine on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, we look at it, we look at a few things. So first it was, um, when we launched our Instagram feed four years ago, it was a total experiment. and. It, what, it started to evolve our, our visual language and a bit of our identity and, and um, back to the point of kind of the rock star scientists and the rock star engineers and, and having a sense that there is really cool stuff happening on our floors. And so we look at all of your normal social metrics, reach, engagement. We're thinking a lot now about own channels and how do we program channels and evolve from experiments to programming strategies for three months, six months, a year. So an example of that would be, anyone here running YouTube channels? Sarah Joy, we love YouTube. Really hard to build <laughs> subscriber base. Um, but what you notice on YouTube is there's an entire ecosystem around YouTube creators. So folks who you may not find on TV, but who have audiences of two, five million people and are making quite a bit of money, and understand how to create content that builds really engaged audiences on YouTube. And so we've experimented with some of them um, who've been fantastic. We had a group, the slow-mo guys, a couple of guys who shoot experiments in slow motion. If you wanna see them like destroy a giant water balloon in slow motion, it's actually quite mesmerizing. Uh, but we had them come up to our research center in, uh, in upstate New York and go through three advanced manufacturing experiments in slow motion. So, hydrophobic coating, 3D printing, microelectromechanical switches. These are like heavy, heavy concepts. But when you shoot a, a cold spray 3D printing gun in slow motion or you watch the droplets bounce off of a hydrophobic coated um, substrate, it's a fascinating way in. And then you have them cracking jokes in the background in their lab coats. It's a fascinating way in for a, a broader audience, the next generation of people who are interested in science and technology. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great type of content for YouTube. So this year we hired our own creator, a creator in residence, her name's Sally LePage. She is a PhD candidate at Oxford. Uh, she would like to be a science communicator. She, has a, um, she had a YouTube channel, but was kind of up and coming. And we wanted to, to take the opportunity, not just to bring on great talent with great audience, but also foster new voices in this space. And so she's been with us for three months telling GE stories, but also talking about some of the, the science out there in culture. So we have a series called Fiction Fast Forward, actually, where she is, we're looking at major movie releases. So films like Chappie and Mad Max and Tomorrowland, and talking about the science that you see in them with GE voices, um, with folks like Bill Nye the Science Guy, and just, again, allowing for that conversation uh, around the future of technology. So, you know, if we can program channels over the long term, um, that's kind of what we're looking for. And then how do we also make sure we're being really smart about reaching our customer audiences, certainly as they evolve and move online, um, and getting them the right information and getting them connected with our sales folks too in a much more strategic way. And I think Facebook, the targeting capabilities that are available on Facebook now and LinkedIn um, and Twitter allow us to reach these audiences. It's no longer a world of Facebook's dying, no business people are on Facebook, no one's gonna use social media, it's reality now. Um, and these folks are reachable and they're reachable in new ways and so we're looking very closely at that as well. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I would like to open, we have one more minute for questions. I would like to, uh, we would like to take a couple of questions quickly. Yes. Yeah, so we have a great um, blog, GE Reports, 
which uh, we have a managing editor in-house named Tomasz Kellner, who's incredibly talented. And that is our um, kind of publication of record for the company. And so it's, we also have a great social media partner in VaynerMedia. But I think that we think very hard about making sure that we have the right information as GE out there, showing up to the conversation so that there is a clear record of what's happening and there is more of a sense of transparency around what's happening at the company. Um, and then if and when there is a negative comment to be dealt with, having a great piece on G reports to say, actually, this is what's really happening. Uh, and over time, it's a bit of a long game, right? Over time, building communities um, and, you, and building trust among those communities. And it's funny because when we first launched our Facebook page, we got a lot of negative comments. But over time, as we built trust and we were very responsive, you would start to see that community, the negative comments reducing, and then folks within the community coming in to defend us as the brand over time. So it's, it's a bit of that long game and transparency and, and speaking up. Uh, wonderful. It looks like we are out of time. I want to thank you uh, uh, both for participating, and I want to thank you, everyone in the audience as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.